the title of this talk, and it actually begins, is Archimedes. And by this, what is Archimedes famous for? Streaking. Streaking. Okay, so what is streaking? <laughs> what do you mean streaking? Streaking. Okay, so here's what he did. Okay, I don't know if you guys, are you familiar with the story? Maybe you're not. So, I'll tell you the story. Uh, Archimedes was trying to figure out... Exactly, he's the one that said Eureka. So he was trying to figure out, why, you know, how can I figure out this problem? I've got my, my friend, the king, he gave, some, he gave this guy some gold, and he thinks that the guy didn't use all the gold for the crown, he actually put some silver in there, but silver is less dense than gold. I can get the weight of the crown, and the weight set stays the same. But even though Archimedes was really great at, he was, he was perfect at geometry. The crown was kind of complicated, so he couldn't really get the volume of it. So when he was sitting in the bath, he realized, hey, I can get the volume of something by just putting it in water and seeing how much water that displaces. Does that make sense? Yes. Great. Okay, so he was so excited about that that he ran up out of the bath, no clothes on, went down the street yelling, hey, I, I did it, Eureka. So that's, that was the birth of streaking, and he's very famous for that. He's also very famous for calculating pi to many digits. So he determined pi and it's also known, although not, it's not known as well for English-speaking countries, but elsewhere it's actually known as Archimedes' constant, after him. Now, does anyone, can anyone read this? Any, any Greek readers? My, my Greek writing might be a little sloppy. Okay, so did you ever wonder why anyone called this pi? What, what's the point of pi? Why pi? Why not tau or beta? Well, the reason is, is because it used to be called perimeter divided by diameter. And perimeter, that's perimeter in Greek. Notice the first letter, pi, and that's why we call the perimeter divided by the diameter of a circle is, is pi. Really, we're just abbreviating it for perimeter divided by diameter. Okay, that's... Okay, so let's go on. We'll, we'll revisit pi a little bit more. Um, quick question about pi. Yes! Um, why is it endless? Like, why is, the, why is pi endless? Okay, um, so... Pi is endless because it is a, what's called a transcendental number. Now it can be endless without actually being a transcendental number. That one is actually saying that I can't express it in terms of any algebraic equation. Um, and I can take something like the square root of 2. That's an irrational number. And that one's endless as well. But that one's an algebraic number, because I could say x squared equals 2. That'll solve that one. Uh, now, as far as, as far as the number of rational numbers versus the number of irrational numbers, there's actually a whole, whole, whole lot more irrational numbers than rational numbers. So all the fractions you know, you can, you can get all these fractions, but they don't amount to a hill of beans compared with the rest of the numbers. In fact, the, all the numbers between 0 and 1 are much more than all the rational numbers, all the fractions you can think of. So all the numbers that aren't fractions, that don't have any end to them, are actually bigger. Um, 
Now let's see, why, how can I prove that pi is not 1? Actually, that's kind of a non-trivial question as far as mathematics goes, and it wasn't until like the 18th and 19th centuries where uh, mathematicians proved that you couldn't um, essentially square a circle, that, so that they actually proved yeah, pi is actually an irrational number. Now, as we go further, as I talk a little bit further about pi, uh, we'll see that there were some ways that people in the past had approximated pi and got as close to it as they wanted to. And they did this. Arch Archimedes did this by using... Um, different shapes, like octagons, and then 16 gons, and 32 gons, and then saying, oh, well, I know the, I know the behavior of that circumference. I'm going to take the limit as I make n go to infinity. Anyway, more than you probably wanted to know. So, did that answer your question? Or? Okay, I'll... I'll um, I'll dig up a little bit more on that. Uh, I think actually a proof that to show that pi is irrational might actually be a little bit involved. So let's let's move on. Thanks. Good question though. That's a really good question. Okay, so now we're going to go to China, and this is in the 200 and 400s. So um, there are two important. Chinese scientist Lui, Lui Hui and Zhu Chanji, and let's go into those a little bit. Okay, um, continue. Go next. Okay, um, so those two actually did the power of pi to. Could you go back to it? Yeah, let's see. That, that one was, um, these two did the power of pi, and this value, 355 over 113, was the most accurate value of pi for over 1,200 years. That fraction, so maybe you've heard 22 sevenths, so there's another one, and then this one is the, is the best one until you get into something with more than 10,000 in the denominator. So this one is a very good fractional approximation to pi, and it's, up, it's accurate up to five digits. So, okay, let's go on to the next one. Okay, so um, our next, our next uh, journey takes us to India in the 400s, and this is where someone, Aryabhata, in 476, he started tabulating trigonometry functions. And another person, the Brahmagupta, in the 600s, he discovered that gravity was a source of attraction. And here was the very important thing, is the use of zero as both a placeholder and a digit. Why is that important? Well. Would you guys like to be doing multiplication, square roots, additions with Roman numerals? No. Yeah. Exactly. Roman numerals are horrible to do much calculations with. These, you could arbitrarily, you could put a whole bunch of zeros, you can make something really big. Later, there's actually someone that's uh, Persian that will actually see that they've added in the decimal place so you can make things really small along with that zero. So what Brahmagupta did was very important. So again, we're seeing these different contributions from different parts of the globe. It's not just from Greece. Another thing that India was known for, um, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Damascus steel, uh, when the crusaders were fighting. Anyway, India, was very famous for its very high quality steels used in swords, etc. So 
they also had a very high technology as far as steel making went. Now, back th now we're entering into the golden age of Islam, which does anyone know what part of the globe was covered during this time period? Asia. Asia? Well, so, at least some of Asia, up to India at least. What about uh, any further west, east? How about west? Ottoman Empire. Ottoman Empire, sure. North up to Turkey and then all the way to the Atlantic on the north coast of Africa and then up into Spain as well. So they, they, actually the, the Moors of Spain were not uh, kicked out of Spain by Ferdinand and Isabella until the 1400s. So these two, all right, now let's look at the first person's name, Muhammad ibn Musa al Pazirmi. Now his name gives rise to something that's used in computers, that's saying, oh, I, I use this clever way to write code. And actually his last name is actually what we call algorithm. So an algorithm is a computer program that, that you, a way to write the computer program, a clever way to do it. So algorithm, that's algorizima, is, is his name, and that's actually where that word comes from. He is also, oops, he is also the one that, um, that coined the word or that the word algebra was coined from, because in one of the titles of one of his books, it had algebra in it. Oops, let me go on to the next one. Okay, so here is Jabir ibn Hayyan. He's also during this time period. He was considered the father of chemistry. Now, as we go through here, you'll see that there's a lot of fathers of chemistry, of science, of these things. Unfortunately, there's not many women in these various cultures. There's a few really famous women mathematicians, but as far as the scientists go, there aren't that many, unfortunately. Um, a lot of this was that women were not even an opportunity at, these, at this time. So. Um, that's, that's why we're not getting many women at this point. Um, another, this was al Khaziri. that's a picture of him. Uh, this person, uh, Ibn Sina, or Avicenna as he was known in Europe, he was the first one to do clinical trials. So he wrote on medicine. He also discovered the contagious nature of infectious diseases. So he would put people under quarantine uh, when they had infectious diseases. So, and a lot, uh, he also did things with pharmacy, making sure that dosages were correct, uh, et cetera. So he was very influential in medicine. And a lot of his books were read up into the 1600s at universities in Europe. Now, Ibn al Haytim is considered the first scientist. Why? It wasn't because of the optics, it was actually because of scientific method. He would actually say, okay, here is my hypothesis. Here is my experiment that I'm going to try to falsify my hypothesis. So he was doing the sort of things that you were learning as far as this is the correct way to do science. So he was considered the first scientist because he was actually following out that scientific method and more so he actually wrote down this is the scientific method. This is the way that science should be done. So he was also he was incredibly influential. Now in China, we also go back and forth to China, uh, we have a person, Chen Zhou, and he studied geology, meteorology. He also uh, discovered the compass and its use in navigation and explained 
not only that here it's pointing to north, but also the difference between magnetic north and true north. So north as opposed north in, in terms of here's the north pole of the Earth's rotation versus here's the north pole that the magnet points to them. They're not the same. So he was saying, oh, these two things are not the same and they're off by this much. And using that difference is how we can, that's how we can navigate, is because we, we know that what that difference is. If we didn't know that difference, we would be off quite a bit. Another thing that he invented was dry docks. So for the emperor's boat, that they needed to be repaired, then rather than pull it up onto land or go underwater, it was float it up onto a special dock and raise it up. And so he invented the dry dock. He also studied things like uh, climate change, and he also um, was thinking that a lot of these geological processes happen over a long period of time because near where he lived there were fossils up in the hills. And he was trying to figure out how did these things get here because these are seashells. And these are things that are from the sea but I'm up near the mountains. So how did land that was in the sea get up to be into the mountains? So he was thinking about those things and had written and his ideas were echoed much later by people like Charles Hutton that talked about uh, the way that geological changes happen over a slow time period, gradually, but that landforms change. Okay, so now let's get to Europe. Now we've gotten to the 12th and 13th centuries. And there actually, there actually are, there actually were translations. Okay, during the, during the 12th and 13th centuries, there were translations of the Arabic into the Latin. Now, that's great. The only problem was that the Black Death put a damper on things. So, here they were going along, we were getting all these translations into Latin. There were various scientists in Europe, but before they really got going, then it was essentially 30 to 60 percent of the population in Europe was lost. And in fact, this was worldwide throughout Asia and Europe that the Black Death hit. It was in a wave from China, India, then further through the Middle East into Europe. So essentially, a lot of the civilizations were devastated during that time. For Europe, it took 150 years to get back to the regular population, and there were still occasional plague recurrences, none as bad as that initial wave. So, after 150 years, essentially, then there is a scientific revolution. This is where a bunch of, where finally enough of the of the people get back together again, universities are opening, we finally have a few more communication across cultures that were broken when the plague came. So these things are reopened again. Now we're starting to get some things in Europe happening. So two things are especially important during this year, 1543. First was Andreas Vesalius. He talked about on the working of the human body. And next was Nicholas Copernicus, who on his deathbed decided he would publish his heretical work, De Revolutionibus, which, mean, which is the revolving, which referred to the heliocentric model and his consistent heliocentric model of the Earth and the planets going around the sun. So during this time, 
since all these translations are available, universities are opening up, we're getting a lot of cross-pollination of ideas. So among these great luminaries at this time, we have Galileo, Haley, of, no, anyone know what Edmund Haley is famous for? Uh, Haley? Uh, Haley's Comet is one thing that he's famous for. So he was, so he was an astronomer. Uh, what about Robert Hooke? Has anybody heard of Robert Hooke before? Okay, so you'll, if you haven't heard of Robert Hooke, you will when you take physics. Uh, there'll be Hooke's Law, which is for a string. Um, Tycho Brahe and Kepler were, were both uh, astronomers. Uh, oops. Okay. Uh, Leibniz and Pascal were both uh, mathematicians. Okay, and the big one was Newton publishes Principia Mathematica. That was a very big deal. That was, uh, that explained a lot of things that were mysterious before about force, etc. And now you guys all know about Benjamin Franklin, right? So, yes. so name me a few things that Benjamin Franklin did. Uh, electricity. Electricity. So what kind of electricity did he do? Or electric currents. Electric currents. Well, not so much. Uh, he actually did things with lightning. Was a was a big one. Um, he. Any, anyone else know some other things that um, Benjamin Franklin did? He was involved with the Constitution, that's right. Uh, so he was definitely involved with the government. Um, other things? Let's see. All right, so, so I'll throw in a couple. Let's see. No, he was he was uh, he was very popular going to France because he he was actually because he was known as a scientist and part of the reason he was known as a scientist was he actually published he did publish his uh, his work on lightning and that it was a form of electricity. He also. Uh, developed the lightning rod. There was a uh, stove that he called a Franklin stove that he invented. S there were bifocals. He actually did a whole lot of things. Has anyone been to the Franklin Institute in Philadelphia? No. No. no? Okay, you should go. It's worthwhile. It's a it's a good museum. Um, so I, I definitely suggest that one. Okay. All right. So none of you are in the hall, so I guess we're set to go. Okay. So, um, so another thing that Franklin did was he measured the ocean currents when he was going across uh, the across the ocean to visit England and France, and he actually measured the Gulf Stream. So he, he took some good readings on that and actually had a good current map of the Gulf Stream. So he's one of the co-discoverers and mappers of the Gulf Stream. So let's go from Ben Franklin to the father of modern chemistry, who is Antoine Lavoisier, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, so he was alive from 1743 to 1794. Uh, so he discovered oxygen, hydrogen, and conservation of mass. Now, one problem is, is that he lost his head. 
And this was actually literal. He did lose his head in the French Revolution, uh, unfortunately. Even though he helped develop the metric system, uh, the French government was not um, too kindly taken toward him, since he had been a noble before the revolution. So, unfortunately, even though the French Revolution was saying, oh yes, we're for progress and uh, advancement, uh, they ended up en ending up killing some important scientists. Among them was Antoine Louvestet. Was he the one so, that had students count how many times he blinked? What? Was he the one that had students count how many times he blinked? Oh, I don't know. I hadn't heard that story. That's possible. And then what, what did they do with the number of times that he blinked? Well, they wanted to see how long a human could respond when he lost his head. So whenever his head came off, they wanted to count how many times he could blink. Ah, uh, okay. That's, whoops. That's possible. Wait, let me get this. This uh, came off. Hold on a moment. Oops. Hold on just a moment. I just want to get this. I think I have a problem with the Windows update right at the moment for some. Oh, shoot. All right. <laughs> while this updates, well, fortunately, we started off a little bit early. So while this is updating, uh, kind of annoying that that happened right now. Uh, while this is updating, 